Hey, James, that's our discussion today with Joshua was so cool. I mean, he's talking about pursuing markets, you know, verticals that I would have never thought of. And, and you know, uh, combinations of verticals that we, yeah, right? we might never put together, like CBD and aerospace. Uh, I right. guess that's be about being high, right? Uh- <laughs> <laughs> wow, Patty, you are just really on fire this morning. I'll tell you, man, I, uh, I should have thought of that when we were talking to Joshua. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, you know what made me think of just the whole interview made me think of um, one of the questions that Straw Hacker Group asked me when I was being interviewed, uh, and they said, you know, oh, you've already done all these podcast episodes. Do you think you're going to be able to continue to find new content to put out? Oh yeah. And I said, <laughs> never ending. It's the payments industry, and today is a great example because everything we talked about today are things we pretty much never talked about. So exactly, exactly. Uh, it's a, super interesting. And then uh, I went into questions in the field as my follow up to last week. And this week, I share a very interesting story of a merchant's experience with dual pricing, a, a firsthand experience of a customer and a merchant interacting. Mm-hmm. And I'm there installing right. a terminal and interacting about dual pricing uh, and talking about kind of this um, this interaction and, and what happened. And then tell us about the insider support, Patty. Uh, talking some more about P2P payments and how P2P payments are sort of migrating from, you know, person to person to next to maybe person to business. And, right. um, you know, we, right. I think we're, we're uncovering some real interesting trends there. Sure. So this episode today is, of course, sponsored by NMI.com. But I want to highlight today iriscrm.com. Why is that? Well, because NMI and Iris are together. They've merged right. together. And Iris CRM, if you are not using Iris, if you have not looked at Iris, you are missing out. Um, when I was running an ISO, we used Iris. You've got to look at Iris because of something I talk about all the time on the show, uh, Patty, which is opportunity cost. Right. 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 If you're sitting there figuring out residual splits for your agents. Um, if you're trying to pull data in and get it to your customers in the right in the right dashboard and you're doing all this work, just use Iris. They are already fully integrated with all possible kind of processes you could think of. Um, they have fantastic technology, mobile friendly, mm-hmm. um, everything you want. So it's Iris CRM. So think Salesforce or Pipedrive or Zoho, but specifically created for payment processing and for right. ISOs in, you know, in particular. So go right. to Iris, I-R-I-S, CRM.com, schedule a free demo. Let them know you heard about us, about them on the Merchant Sales Podcast. So Patty, with that being said, I'm ready to dive in if you are. Let's go. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Hey, everybody. Patty and I are here today with Joshua Benedetti, who is the CEO at Cards In. How are you doing today, Josh? I'm good. How are you? Good. Fantastic. So we are going to be talking today about building a, what I'm calling for this episode, a non-traditional ISO. And and I guess I should say, Josh, really, it means more of a traditional ISO that's going after non-traditional merchants would probably be the better explanation. Um, But, you know, we talk a lot about going after retail. We talk even about high risk a little bit, card not present. But there's this idea that's been growing with kind of the verticalization of the market and different software solutions and saying, you know, let's go after some of these kind of untapped verticals. And so that's what we're going to talk about today and the way you've built your ISO, Josh, which is really, I think, uh, very intriguing. Before we do that, though, I always like to hear the story. So how did you get into this crazy industry? How did you end up going after some of these kind of non-traditional business types versus just kind of the normal, uh, you know, the normal ISO in a box kind of thing that we say? Yeah. So, um, I mean, like most of us in the industry, we were probably in another industry and we saw a big gap and said, Hey, why don't I fill that gap? Um, so my background actually worked in finance. I was an investment banking stockbroker, did day trading, uh, spent some time on the CBOE and uh, Chicago options exchange. And then, uh, from there I left finance and went into aerospace and defense contracting for 10 plus years. Wow. That's a big change. A huge change. (laughs) Um, From there, uh, I worked for service providers, boutique stores, uh, some boutique shops and some larger outfits. And then I had my own firm for about five or six years. And at that point, um, my wife had some health issues. I took a year or two off, dealt with that. Um, in the interim, I went back to school, got my lean, uh, lean six Sigma green belt, uh, went back and got, a went to Harvard for contract law. Uh, obviously that kind of played into the aerospace with all the con- government contracting I was sure. doing. Uh, and from there I was kind of like, okay, what's next? 
And so, you know, the wife and I were talking about next plans and, um, the funny story was we were watching a home improvement, one of those, you know, reno re- renovations. Yeah, uh-huh. I love and, those shows. <laughs> you know, the the husband and wife, they bought the, this multi-million dollar home. They were doing a multi-million dollar reno. And she's like, why don't you do what they do? And I'm like, well, what do they do? So we're watching the show and the husband was in uh, finance uh, doing it like investment banking. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if I really want to go back into that specific side of finance. And the wife did merchant processing. Wow. And now I kind of got kind of jumped forward a little bit here, but when I was doing my consulting huh. work for a couple of years, when I would go in for process improvement or, uh, uh, you know, any type of program management, I would turn around and I would immediately go after their merchant services as the first project because it was an easy win. And right. this is going back to like 2011 ish. There wasn't a lot of B2B. There wasn't a lot of level three really out there. Um, so I would go after that. And it, being in aerospace, it was all B2B, all level three. And so one example was uh, a company was doing about a half million a year in processing, saving them about twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year in credit card fees. So I'd show the win and then I'd get more business. So I was like, interesting. So as we were watching the show, I turned around and I was like, well, I'm going to call all my old contacts and see like, hey. How do you do this? You know, what what kind of contracts and so forth and uh, kind of led to where I'm at now. I did about two years of research and development, taught myself the industry, uh, then about another year uh, kind of building out the framework, getting contracts with, you know, acquirers and banks. And then we launched Cardzone. Mm. Very wow, cool. that's so interesting. So can I, is, I, yeah, go ahead, Patty. Just a quick, because you said you went to Harvard for contract law. So you got a law degree or was that more of a um, business degree? Yeah, it was more um, in the business side. Related okay, just trying to, to get the- a sense because it's like, but obviously yeah. you, you, you're you learning about the legal aspects of business, right? So well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a very cool background. Law, it was actually taught by a law professor. And so it's, it, it, I have a certificate from Harvard in contract law for uh, contracts and it, it deals with businesses and how you set up contracts, what makes them legally mm-hmm, binding, mm-hmm. you know, case law, uh, all of that. Yeah, that's. I, a, I mean, we've seen people, I think, James, you would agree. We've seen people that have, nobody, Josh, comes from, you know, grew up saying I'm going to be emergent services specialist, right? Right, um, right. We've seen them from all over. But I have to admit, this is the first person I've met that was a contract law expert. Yeah, and that's that good, to that's me good. is, a, is yeah. a skill set that applies so well to this industry. Well, and I think another interesting example of it would be like uh, maybe Jonathan Rossi at Cardax, mm-hmm. who wasn't contract law, but was a constitutional lawyer. And so then went right. to surcharge. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, Josh, one thing I think is so interesting is that there's so much opportunity in the payment space that I think it's very easy for people to kind of get in their little box and go like, okay, well, this is what I'm going to sell. And a lot of times they they don't think about the other strengths that they have, the other knowledge that they have and mm-hmm. kind of where that could, if they could fit all the pieces together. So here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to talk about aerospace. So what I, I was trying to figure out, how do we have this conversation? Because you do so many different things. And I thought, let's like zero in on one vertical that nobody would think of going after. Um, probably even after this podcast, no one's ever going to think about going after this. But I wanted to kind of zero in on one to talk about kind of how different it is and, and the approach and things like that then we'll kind of zoom out and and have a broader conversation. So let's talk aerospace for a second. I don't think anybody listening has ever thought about selling an aerospace account. So I guess start off by telling us what is an aerospace merchant services account? What does that mean exactly? And you already kind of mentioned this a little bit, but talk about kind of your, you know, getting into it. uh, You know, what was it that sparked the interest into starting and, and getting some aerospace accounts? Um, what actually started it was my time in the aerospace industry. Of course. Um, there was a huge disconnect and it, it, there were a multitude of reasons. Uh, one, it was all B2B. Um, and most merchant service providers think transaction, transaction, doesn't matter. Consumer business, it's a transaction. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's the first component. The second component is the ticket size of these transactions. Um, most of our merchants in, in that category, their average ticket is $25,000, dollars We have merchants renting tickets for $100,000, $150,000, $250,000, one single ticket. 
Um, and so that component, there's a huge disconnect. Uh, processors don't like it because of risk. Right. <laughs> um, right. And, and so that started uh, my interest in, in how to fill that gap because of my Lean Six Sigma. Uh, so sure. what I did was, um, uh, as I entered the, the industry, I turned around and I said, well, I have my experience there. I'm going to kind of start there and target them. But then I went to my acquirers and I said, look, I said, this is, this is our primary focus that we're going to start at. And I said, what do I need to give underwriters, the bank, that warm, fuzzy feel, feeling to approve this deal? Yeah. Um, so we went through some examples, uh, application packages, what kind of information there, ticket sizes, um, you know, are the, these guys a service provider or are they providing tangible products? Um, so, and then we went through the industry credit rating as a whole, um, how we were going to package and transmit that data, uh, specifically with like level three combined into that. Um, so we don't, you know, just blanket level three data. We actually build out profiles for their specific industry, what type of products they're selling. If it's a, you know, if it's a widget versus, uh, you know, fluids, or if it's, you know, landing gear versus an airplane wing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what we kind of did. Uh, and that's, how, that's how I initially started. Yeah. Okay. So then and if I can just, ahead. I just, I'm sorry. I just, cause when I talk, when you talked about that and we've talked about B2B in the past and, you know, my history is that most B2B transactions historically have been by check. So are these payments that were already going by card or were you converting them from check ACH and other mechanisms. I mean, some already go. Some already go to credit cards. Okay. Um, okay. Whether it's it's a new relationship, whether it's an international customer, mm -hmm. um, whether they're just looking to keep cash flow going, mm -hmm. um, you know, because obviously when they're giving out terms, they're pretty much acting as the bank for for their customers. Right. Um, and then some of them we try to convert. So okay. as, as we build out their profiles and we do that interchange optimization and we get their rates down, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we then turn around and say, okay, well, what's the true cost of right. invoicing somebody waiting net 30, net 45, net 60, 90 versus taking a credit card now, getting that cash flow in the door. And uh, uh, I actually just read a, a paper by Visa that said the cost of accepting a credit card on a b2b transaction versus providing payment terms was cheaper oh yeah yeah and actually yeah. that was I th i'm pretty sure that paper was uh, written by roger McNair. roger i was just gonna say because that sounds like he was yeah. a good friend of mine yeah so um yeah it, it's it's amazing i think i think your point here one of the things we certainly don't want to gloss over we've talked about it several times in fact i just put out uh wednesday the well i guess it'd be like a week ago by the time this airs but I just put out an edition of our merchant sales insight talking about interchange optimization. And so I think it's very important to understand, like you said, you know, uh, in our industry, there's this misconception that interchange is interchange. It's like, well, you're running a card transaction. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just, it right. is what it is. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> you can submit additional data. You could do things differently, use different technology solutions, auto populate, uh, prompt the, the merchant to populate and get level two, maybe even level three. And I would imagine in this case, probably a lot of level three, right? I mean, most of these have got to be B to G or, or some version of that, right? Right. And that's another component outside of the B to B is the B to G. Mm -hmm. um, so most of your government contracts, your larger ones will go through, um, you know, ACH, but with GSA and with what they consider emergency buys, we, we need the product in the next 30, 60, 90 days. Right. They, they have government credit cards. And so they'll go out and they'll purchase that on their government credit card to get the material quickly. Yep. So providing that inf extra information, and, and I tell people, try to explain, you know, level three to somebody that doesn't know it. What I say is it's additional data sets that you pass in the transaction that allows the bank to get more visibility, reduce risk, and also allows visa and so forth to say hey we sold or exported this many widgets or this many nikes and you know those pie charts that you always see and you're like how how do they know this well, how right. do they have this data so that's right. where that comes from sure. okay got it so we've already touched on the the kind of a little bit of the vetting process where you know you found these acquiring banks or processors and you 
um, worked with them and kind of explained, hey, here's what I'm going to go after and got kind of the lay of the land from them. What I'm curious about is once you got through all of that, tell us about how you got your first deal. I would assume it probably was one of your existing connections or something, but like how long did that take? What was that process like to get your first aerospace merchant account done? Uh, the first couple were a little bit longer. Um, so they were ranging between 30 and 90 days from initial, you know, uh, pitch to getting the application package and, and everything filled out, submitting it to underwriting, getting it approved, boarded and, and live. Um, but my first uh, account, I actually got at a trade show. Um, so I went to industry trade shows, walked the floor, spoke to people, um, you know, told them about the product. And uh, uh, I actually picked up my, my first customer there. Wow. That's awesome. So yeah, it's funny. I, I was talking to somebody yesterday that um, goes after a unique vertical and they also talked about the trade shows as being a really, really important um, you know, place to go. So um, has it gotten easier? You keep going after it the has. vertical, you know, has it gotten faster? Has it gotten easier? Tell us a little bit about kind of the state of it, you know, today. Yeah. So um, now we work a lot off of referrals. Um, so we, we get referrals from our existing customer base. Obviously they're really happy with the, the technology stack. They're happy with the processing rates. Um, you know, our customer support, all of our technology and reporting, and then we get a lot of referrals from the industry. That's a big one. Uh, we also have done custom integrations with, uh, specific providers. So, uh, we work with somebody who built out a customer software, for airlines to do in-flight entertainment processing. So they manage all the, you know, products that they help facilitate the transaction. Wow. They connect to our gateway and then we do all the processing from there. Wow. That's, that's actually really cool. I know Patty has a follow-up, but I just want to like that. I want to zero in on that for one second. Sure. So I love that idea of going deeper and saying, okay, we already have these aerospace clients, you know, and you're getting this one side of these massive transactions and everything. And then it's like, how do we go the other direction? So you're saying that you if I had a mutual connection or you just went out and found a freelancer or like, how did you, how did you kind of go down that road of, of getting this integration done to, to capture this like massive additional volume? Uh, it was actually, that one was an inbound lead <laughs> from our website. Um, really? So, you know, the marketing, the, the branding behind it, uh, social media, digital content, pay per click. Um, we, we use all different types of avenues, obviously different, different channels have higher conversion, better success. Um, but now we're able because of my industry and actually somebody else in that works for, for cards and has in, uh, industry, uh, aerospace industry experience. So there's a multitude of us that have knowledge and know the terminology, know what types of businesses we're looking at. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, somebody who's doing part sales versus an airlines or a travel agent. So we know, we know the industry really well. Um, and because of that, we know exactly what needs to be put into the application package mm -hmm. to get this through our, our turnaround time. Now, um, we can get approvals on these accounts within 24 to 72 hours. Wow. 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 Can we, um, I'd like to maybe, you know, zoom out a little bit and look at some other types of businesses uh, outside of aerospace that ISOs may not be going after aggressively. We've talked in the past, I know we've had Roger McNamara and a few other people on talking about the opportunities in B2B. Um, you know, uh, this is, you know, there's obviously other B2B uh, areas that will, you could progress from. Um, seems like you've already started doing that. Um, what though do you think, what's your sense, you know, being imbued in this B2B space, what's your sense of the state of opportunities um, in the B2B market right now? And, and more, more importantly, just how competitive is it? The opportunity in B2B is huge. There's a lot of business, a lot of volume. Um, and a lot of big tickets. Well, it depends on the industry. Okay. Um, so some are, some industries may be smaller. They may be, you know, two to $5,000 transactions. Aerospace, okay. obviously, obviously. Um, right. on, on the part sales, they're higher. But, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you look at like an airlines, their ticket sizes are smaller, you know, 2000 and under typically. Um, 
So it really depends on, on the industry that you're looking at. Medical is going to be completely different. Um, I, I know we have a couple uh, merchants in medical. Okay. And so you, you kind of got to do your research. You really have to know um, how their business operates, the flow of the transaction. This isn't, you know, we don't take the approach of like a stripe or a square. Here's your price, set up your account, start processing right now. Mm -hmm. um, we go in and, you know, part of, part of the process is KYC, know your customer. So we actually take time to speak to them. Hey, what are you, what technology are you looking for? What features are you looking for? Uh, what added valued services? What are your goals? Where do you want to, you know, what do you want to achieve? Your expectations. So we go through all of this. Um, so our our initial interaction is is much slower mm -hmm. uh, because we build out that profile. We sure, really it takes get time to build that, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not saying it takes days, but it takes a conversation. It takes some information from the merchant speaking to them, um, and then from there we build out a custom solution. Of, on every deal. Um, so it's it's not a plug and play like a traditional e-com or retail where it's, here's your price, here's a terminal or a gateway, you're ready to go. Right, right. I do, I, I believe that I, I heard that you all also do some work in the CBD space, um, which of course seems a lot different than, than aerospace. And I'm just wondering, you know, what got you intrigued about this? And also, I mean, we know that this is a very difficult vertical to go after, um, you know, given federal laws and all that kind of stuff. Do um, you have any tips that um, ISOs and agents out there um, might be able to use to go after this vertical and get these shops approved? Yeah, the biggest, I mean, the number one item that I see, actually there's two items, but the number one item that I see that causes a lot of problems for these merchants are their COAs or test reports on oh, okay. the product. Mm -hmm. So that's typically where merchants will have issues getting approvals because the federal guidelines say it needs to be under 0.3% right. THC. And, it's, and the states are different, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you have different states. And then, you know, you have a bunch of new... Um, uh, items that came out in, in CBD. Right. So it's not just THC now. Now you have a synthetic THC. And what you is have that? Yeah, HHC, so you have right. Delta 8, 9, Delta 8, 10, right. 11. So you have all these different, uh, you know, there's THCO and THCV. <laughs> and right, so right, right. What, what I try to tell people is, look, when you look at the test reports, you want to really focus in on anything with THC and that it's under 0.3. Right. I've seen deals where we've done the application package, got all the documents, prepared the whole file, but we never got the, the COAs. And then at the very end, we get them and it's the merchant's all, at 0. 0.32. Yeah. And you're right. like, it's done. There, there's no way around it. You can't sell that product. Right. Um, so that's the biggest issue. So I would say always start, start with the COAs. Okay. Um, okay. Then from there, uh, the, the second thing that I see that really holds up these files and causes issues with the merchants is um, the organization of their business and how their record retention is. So, mm. oh, I misplaced my COA. I don't know where it is. Or, well, you know, yeah. they decide to label their COAs with, you know, a number sequence and it doesn't match the name on the website. You know, so like if they're selling, you know, CBD gummy bears you know, make sure that COA matches CBD gummy bears. Mm -hmm. That's going to allow us and our banks to review those packages faster mm -hmm. and get them approved. So with our application package, we've been doing this for three, four years now with okay. CBD. If, if the COAs pass and we get a complete application package, we have a hundred percent approval rate. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. That's actually very insightful. I very insightful. I, I I did not realize that difference, and so that kind of leads me just a quick follow up. Um, you know, I travel up and I live on the East Coast. You know, I travel up and down, and I live in Maryland, where where um, medical marijuana is legal in DC. It's legal. But you go down in North. I was down in North Carolina not long ago. I was at a gas station with all these CBD products at the gas station, and I my you know I said to my friends, it's like. How did they, I wonder how they got their credit card processing agreement. I mean, that was immediately where I went to. 
So what you're saying is that even in those situations, right? It, I mean, in a state like North Carolina, where it's not legal, then you'd have to go by the federal guidelines to sell it, correct? Well, you have to check. You have to check. There's okay. You actually have to go through county because okay. there's some counties in the state you. that have. Right. So, and we have a list um, yeah, sure, sure. that we typically provide, but county, state, and and uh, where they're shipping, if they're shipping international, um, uh -huh. obviously that that's a whole nother- A whole different ball of wax. Yeah, a whole nother ball game. Um, yeah. But you have to go through it. And and some states, you know, you can sell Delta 9, but you can't sell Delta 8, or you can sell Delta 8, yeah. but not Delta 9. And, and so you, you that's one thing that we really specialize in, and we're actually- developing and launching a fully compliance program for these merchants so we can build out terms and conditions policies and procedures mm -hmm. specific guidelines for them and then we'll provide them continuous updates uh -huh. as things change right uh, because it's obviously totally fluid it's for a monthly subscription right right we can do that continual support very cool very, very cool funny. i just find that it's it's, it's you know Aerospace CBD. I mean, <laughs> right, they're like right. worlds apart. But in, what you're saying is, in some respects, it's it's similar kind of KYC routines that you're going through. Yeah, it's there's a lot of KYC in 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 our process, and especially initially. Um, obviously, we deal with a, a bunch of other high risk categories: gaming, gambling, um, uh, nutraceuticals, adult. We deal with. Uh, forex crypto um so we can support all of these verticals okay um, and and it, it was basically when, when we first started out we started out with the b2b and then we started getting everybody's prohibited and restricted lists and we mm -hmm. said okay this is what you don't do now let's find somebody who can support it right and we have probably 20 30 different acquirers banks and relationships out there because not everybody supports all of those industries and not everybody right. not everybody's going to understand with their underwriting team those industries so you really have to find somebody who is good in a specific vertical um and that's you know reliable and stable and then it, it the process becomes much smoother right. one of the one of the really interesting things about this conversation to me josh is that you know one of the themes that i feel like is coming out of this is you know, this idea of becoming kind of a non-traditional ISO or going after non-traditional merchant accounts, rather, um, it seems like the core competency is this idea of going deep and understanding, okay, who am I going to go after? Where is there kind of some open runway? Where is there, you know, an opportunity? And, you know, where the, where the differentiating factor is knowledge, you know, do right. you really deeply understand this business? Do you deeply understand how they need to process payments how they're maybe legally allowed or not allowed to process payments, um, how, you know, what kind of banks and processors are willing to process these payments. So I love that. And I think, um, you know, I think not everybody on our podcast would say, well, that could be my core competency, but there are people out there that are like, hey, I've got this background, you know, I've, uh, whatever it is, you know, they're in a position where they could be a person that would do this kind of deep research. Um, and it's an, it's an opportunity. So last one I have real quick, just touch on international real quick for us. Mm -hmm. So international accounts have always, frankly, not an area of expertise for me at all. I'm really, I had somebody just the other day reach out to me and said, <clears throat> we want to do uh, processing international transactions and they want to hire me as a consultant. And I said, no. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not the guy for that. So tell us a little bit about that. What's the deal with international? How big of an opportunity is it? How hard is it to get these accounts? Um, there's a big opportunity international. Um, the the difficulty varies by country or or region. Um, so Canada is very similar to the U.S., um, but different personalities, different. Um, the, the process is is a little bit, I don't know, a little bit different than what we're used to in the U.S. We're fast, we we move, we get things done, we work right. all day, you know. So a little bit different. Europe, kind of the same thing, but in Europe. The process actually works, and, and originally I said the process works backwards. Um, so in the U.S., you quote somebody, you get the application, you get the documents, you submit them in underwriting, and it gets approved. In Europe, uh, when we originally started, uh, the process was a soft quote. You got documents. It then went to underwriting, and based on the risk of those 
the business and, and the, the company, the owners, then the formal price would be issued, put on the application or the contract, and then sent to the merchant to sign and approval. Mm. So the process worked a little backwards. Um, now, there's obviously other providers and it's it's they're trying to streamline it, get more like the U.S. so you can board more right. accounts. Um, but that was one of the biggest learning curves overseas. Um, obviously, language barrier. There's a lot more verification in, in Europe, verifying uh, people and businesses. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a you definitely need to find people that are experienced in that specific vertical because there there are some nuances yeah. that you're not going to know only working in the U.S. Right. right. And I would imagine a language barrier can be, can be, you know, a, not a nuisance, but can, you know, it can be a barrier, obviously, if you're, you know, if you're selling in, uh, I don't know, Holland. Estonia. Yeah, Estonia. <laughs> Latvia, right. you know, Germany, country, Italy. Countries that you don't think that, to, you know, we, we all in high school might have learned German, French, or Spanish, but right. you know, outside of that. I, that could be very tough, right? Do you do you hire local people to do that in those countries? We have a couple agents overseas okay. that help facilitate deals, submit deals. Um, then, uh, surprisingly, though, a lot of these people, even if it's broken English, do speak enough mm-hmm. to, you know, facilitate the the application and the, and right. the process. Um, and some of our partnering banks actually want documents translated into English. So we have to get documents in whatever native native language, and then we have to get a certified copy in English. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Very well, interesting. you know, I think we could probably go on for a while longer and just talk about all these other verticals. There's so much to talk about, Josh, but um, this has been so insightful. I've learned a lot. I know our audience is probably reeling a little bit with information overload and, and you know, digesting. And I would say to those people that are feeling that way, you know, zoom out and get the bigger picture, which is find a vertical that's underserved and understand them deeply so you can serve them, right? That's, that's really the big takeaway. So Josh, uh, again, thank you so much for taking your time. Uh, People want to learn more about CardZen. They want to learn more about you or connect with you. Where would you send them? Uh, Obviously go to our, start at our website, Um, go to the contact us page, you know, say that you're interested in partnering with us and then, you know, we'll have a conversation. And that's where the KYC starts, you know, so what are they looking to do? Um, And from there, we'll be able to set up, you know, specific features, benefits, ref shares. And 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 I wouldn't give them that website because I know the the spelling is a little bit different than what they might think. Uh, www.cardzen.com and it's spelled card, C-A-R-D-Z-3-N.com. Got it. So the oh, the, so the, Z three. It's not the three. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. The, the the E is just a three. So it's a backwards E there, right? Is the idea? Yeah. It's it's basically like a backwards E. Yeah. So C A R D Z three N. Correct. Not okay. Card Zen. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's very cool. I like it. Awesome. Well, Josh, thank you again so much for your time and your insights. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to jump on with us today. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. It was really great. Thank you. So, Patty, I talk to people all the time on the consulting side. They're asking right. me about technology, right? We have a oh. small ISO. We're growing. We're scaling. Uh, we have a, you know, we're hiring our first couple of sub agents. What CRM should we use? What technology do we need? And I say, well, you can buy seven or eight different technology solutions, or you can just use Iris, right? <laughs> right. right. Um, Iris CRM, I think, is so fantastic because even though there are ISOs out there, larger acquiring banks or, or large ISOs that provide some solutions, you know, mm-hmm. natively, even for free in some cases. Sure. The difference is then you don't control that tech stack. You don't control right. the experience. And, and let's say that maybe you have a merchant and you want to put that merchant with Fiserv instead of with your normal, which might be Tesis or right. WorldPay or Elevon or whatever. Well, if you want to have one seamless experience where your agents can see all their residuals and get paid out, where your merchants can see their dashboard, where you can get notifications when merchants stop processing and just all these like really specific things along with the broader, just what you would expect with CRM technology. Iris CRM has everything all in one and it is unbelievably easy to use. So I would encourage everybody listening, stop listening for just a second right now, pause the show. I'll come back. Come back. 
But pause the show. Go to iriscrm.com. I-R-I-S crm.com um there's a two buttons there you can watch a video about it or you can schedule a demo right. let me encourage you if you have even one sub agent or more all the way up to being a humongous company yeah the largest isos in the country are using this tool go to iriscrm.com schedule a demo and let them know that you heard about them on the merchant sales podcast hattie and i would really appreciate that we yes, just took on the sponsorship with nmi we worked with in the past but now the NMI has Iris. We're going to be going back and forth and getting some great content out about both. So please take a little time to go to iriscrm.com, schedule a demo, let them know you heard about the uh, about them on the show. Uh, yeah, and we really appreciate it. We would. So thanks everybody so much for just listening to the show. Yeah. Now let's move on to the next segment. Have segment. a wonderful go. holiday weekend. And now here is questions from the field with James Shepard. So, Patty, uh, last week on Questions in the Field, I was talking about how to sell dual pricing. And uh, I said that this week I would share a story uh, from my experience at a local business. And I thought it was kind of an interesting story that I wanted to share. Um, and it speaks to kind of a larger point that I want to make. So here's what happens. So I'm in a business. I'm installing a uh, Valor VL110, I think it was. Um, installing a Valor terminal, dual pricing. And... Uh, while I'm in the midst of setting this up, a customer walks in. Now, now I should back up a second. This merchant currently before me did not accept credit card payments. Oh, wow. So I was in a Mennonite uh, community. Sure. sure. And so this particular business, owner, maybe wasn't like against it or anything like no, that. No, no, no. But yeah. But it was just a community that uses cash a lot. And, and he was not. But he actually does business with a lot of outside uh, you know, people, of course. And so um, when I went and talked to him about it, he had had credit card processing before. It had some bad experiences in the past. And he finally just kind of got rid of it. And he does fairly large average ticket sizes. So um, while I'm there, a customer walks in. And says, you know, hey, and you know that he was writing up this order. And meanwhile, I'm I'm getting this, uh, you know, terminal ready. And uh, he, the guy says, uh, can I pay with my card? <laughs> so there's this kind of awkward moment where I'm like, well, I'm like 15 minutes away from having this done, you know. <clears throat> and he's and I I I kind of chimed in real quick and and I just said, well, you you came 15 minutes too early. I'm literally setting the machine up right now. Uh, and for my friend here, you know. And uh, anyway, this guy who is the business owner says to them. He says, yeah, he says, you could, he said, I don't mind if you, you know, come back later in the day to pay or over the phone. And he said, just remember that if you pay with a card, I charge an extra, uh, he said, I charge an extra 4% if you pay with a card. Well, this was like a $900 purchase. Whoa. And the guy said, you know, no, like, well, he's like, well, uh, we'll just, I guess, write a check. And, but it was this very negative experience. Uh huh. Uh, for the customer and you know these he's asking his wife if she has her checkbook and they get there you know and it was just a very negative experience so when they left i was finishing up the terminal and when i got it done i said now before i leave i said let's have a conversation about communicating with your right. customers right right and so one thing that i think is very important to understand and, and again let me be clear that was a negative experience for the merchant as well for the business right. owner sure. he could tell that his client wasn't really very happy with this you know right and so it was such a cool experience because I got this. So uh, I'll tell more about the story. But what happened was I had this conversation. I said, look, when they ask you, don't tell them that you charge extra for a card. All you want to do is what during the conversation, key the cash amount into the credit card machine. And when it's a dual price with Valor, it pops up on the screen as this cash and card. Right. And I said, just let them know that you have a cash and a card price, just like fuel stations. And you can say, you know, uh, just like the fuel stations, we have a cash and a card price. Mm -hmm. For your order, the cash price would be 900. The card price would be 960 or, or whatever, whatever that would be, right? Um, I guess that'd be really high. Actually, it'd be like 937. 36, I thought I did in yeah. my head, but. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so that's what you, you know, would do. And um, so we talked about that for a little while. I talked to him about the fact that I said, you know, you don't want, you know, I, I had to explain to him to say like, the idea here is I'm not trying to show you how to trick your customers right. into paying your processing fees without noticing. Right. I actually believe that this program is the right thing to do. I think it's the fair thing to do for your customers, not just for you. Obviously, you're eliminating your processing fees, which is great. And I had this conversation with every business owner. I was a little rusty, to be honest. And I hadn't I almost, done it in a while. Sure. I hadn't done it in a little while. And, I, I, and it's dual pricing, which is a little different than cash discounting. I'm mean, not much, but it's a little different. And I'm trying to like, okay, wait a minute. How did I explain this before? And so, you know, um, 
And when I actually got into the conversation, we had a really good conversation about it. And I got him to the point where he believed in the program that I had sold him. He already believed yeah. in, okay, I'm gonna say processing is a, it's yeah. a necessary evil. I can do this dual pricing thing and I don't have to pay any fees. So I guess I'll do it, you know, and, but it wasn't like he believed it was the right thing to do for right. his customer. Right. It's so important that you get your customers. I saw a post on Facebook about this the other day, but it's so important you get your customers to, to understand this. So this guy has a fairly busy shop. He actually had a, a, a different shop. So that he needed two terminals, kind of a, it's hard to explain, but anyways, two counters, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. So I'm setting the other one up. Another customer walks in. So that's great. Another right. customer walks in. Got to test it. Yes. Now they didn't spend quite as much. It was maybe $450 or something like that. But he took the terminal I had just trained him on. And it was so cool. I wish I would have videoed it. So I'm doing the other terminal at the other counter. He's at the other one. I'm and, and I, you know, uh, he's going and I'm setting this terminal up for the other counter. And he just keys in the price and says, um, he just says to them, okay, great. So uh, the card price is, you know, whatever it was, you know, 463 and the, the cash price is 450. How'd you like to pay today? And they said, oh, we use a card. And they happy as a clam, thought it was great. Right. And what's great about that is too, in that moment, What's interesting is if you think about these two experiences and the experience for both the business owner and the, and the and the customer, even if that customer would have chosen to pay with cash, it would have still been a great experience. Right. Because all he's not saying, I'm going to charge you extra if you do this, making him seem like a bad guy. Instead, he's just saying, here's my card price. Here's my cash price. And the customer says, if they would have said, oh, we'll take that lower price for cash, they would be happy. Right. If they said, oh, we'll pay with card, they're happy. Both right? of them are happy. And so in either case, and so my point is, and obviously it's a little different uh, for different merchants. You know, I, I, a quick serve restaurant, I don't advise them to give the cash and the card price. I really don't. It's, it's unnecessary to do that. But I also don't advise them to say we add an extra 3%. Just let the sign do the work. Mm -hmm. you pay with a card, run it, and, it, and the, the amount's there. You notify them with the sign. You know, I think that's plenty. Um, but when you're talking about larger tickets, give them the cash and the card price. And what will happen as a business owner, when you do that, it actually gives them this feeling of, okay, they have a cash price and a card price. And consumers, I'm telling you, the biggest thing I found about selling dual pricing and servicing it is that both merchants and consumers really intuitively get this idea of dual pricing. Okay. They understand right. it. They've been and doing they, and it accept for years. It. They've been yes. doing it at gas stations for years. They have. So um, I think that's really important. Definitely check out uh, coming up on this next Wednesday. I alluded to it earlier, but I do have a Merchant Sales Insight coming out, of course, sponsored by Valor, but I'm going to be doing um, how to sell dual pricing. Okay. Um, and so I'd really encourage you to check that one out as well. Um, and uh, I dive a bit deeper into this concept and kind of the, the opening and the overcoming objections and, and kind of the approach as well. Great advice, James. Thanks. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. So, James, you know, P2P payments are really taking off and they're finding their way to the point of sale, yeah. often as replacement for cash or checks. Right. Um, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which keeps tabs on consumer spending habits, reports that the average share of monthly P2P payments using mobile apps, you know, like Venmo or Zelle or whatever, yeah. Yeah. doubled from 15, almost doubled, from 15% to 29% between 2020 and 2021. Wow. Not a whole lot of surprise there because of COVID right. and all. Right. Um, but just to put it in perspective, cash usage, average cash usage, fell from 57% of P2P transactions to 49. Mm. And checks yeah. went from 13 to 9, which is huge okay. for checks. Yeah, yeah it is. <clears throat> now, Lending Tree just did a survey, found 84% of consumers have used a mobile P2P payment app. Not, yeah. And that number rises to 91% for Gen Z and millennials. Right. And another survey just, re, just conducted by the Straw Hacker Group with the ETA mm -hmm. found 82% of merchants accept at least one digital P2P payment option. And 93% of those expect to continue accepting P2P. Mm. Now, as a as a note, I kind of you know took a deep deeper dive into that into that data. To me, it seems that there are a lot of really small merchants here, which yeah doesn't really surprise me. You know, it's yeah. um it it it's like if you're if you're going to you know if you're a massage therapist or you're you know a 
you know, a piano teacher, right? Per- perfect example. I actually had a, uh, uh, a young man who just started his business and was in, you know, my wife, Christina is a teacher. Right. And right. Uh, he had, he had graduated and, and just started his business of doing car detailing. So okay. I reached out and said, Hey, congratulations on your business. Come detail my Ford expedition, you know? Right. So, um, he came out and when I went out and said, how do I pay you? And he said, Oh, just Venmo me, you know? Right. And right. so I talked to him about recurring payments and why he needs a payment gateway. And I'll sell him on that in a week or two. But oh, yeah, sure. for the time being, I was like, yeah, that's interesting. I think that that you're right. I think that's the kind of person that disproportionately is going to use P2P. And I use a lot of, you know, where I am, I use people to help, you know, build my fence, take care of my prop, you know, different right. tasks. And they all, they're all 20 somethings right. and they all want to be paid by, by Ben Mo as well. Yep. Yep. Um, but there were some, some merchants who, um, said that they um, weren't totally satisfied. Really? And comp- yeah. And the complaints included unexplained holds and other delays, okay. as well as high fees. Okay. Because if you want to get that money immediately from Venmo, you pay like one to 3%. Right. Now, the delays, I think, are likely due to the fact that when money is exchanged through many of these P2P networks, you know, like Zelle or Venmo, Right. Um, the money is going into the recipient's account with that network, not into their bank account. Right. Right. So, you know, that could, uh, you know, change as more banks run payments through RTP, which is the real time network operated by the clearinghouse. Right. Um, that's, of course, a, a consortium that's owned by the nation's largest banks. It handled about 37 million transactions valued at about 16 billion in the first wow. quarter of this year. Wow. Okay. And that's up from the first quarter of 2020. So two years ago, it, it was 5 million payments worth $4 billion. So it's like wow. sing, quadrupled, what is it, sing quick, you know, five times, almost five times. Yeah. Um, but here, I thought it was interesting. I, I was look, you know, talking to folks at the clearinghouse. Here's the list of top uses for RTP. Okay. Mobile wallet transactions, of course. Right. Merchant funding. Uh, Elevon is using RTP to fund merchant accounts. Okay. Account to account transfers between banks. Payroll transactions, you know, especially for like hourly workers. Sure. Okay. Sure. Makes sense. Gig workers like Uber and Grubhub. Right. And the other one, which I thought was really, really key is insurance claims. You know, you're in a tornado. They got to get that money to you fast, Right. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, huh. I thought I thought that was really really interesting because you know early in the early days of ACH, yeah. insurance claims were a big deal. That's right. how they were doing it. Right. Now they're doing it through RTP. Hmm. You know, and of course soon the Federal Reserve, as we discussed a few weeks ago, uh, next year they're launching Fed Now. Right. Um, you know, both of these are credit push, so they're a limit, little bit limited at least initially. Right. Um, you know, this means that the money a payor uh, can authorize their FI, their bank, to push credits to another person's account. Debit pull payment, you know, where a biller, for example, requests money to be pulled from a consumer's account, it's probably a few years off. Sure, sure. But, you know, and I, I think um, you and I talked about, we're gonna have somebody on, on, on a future podcast, not too far in the distance, that's using RTP to help merchants. Right. Yeah. So I think that's that, coming up in a few weeks. So, yeah. That's yeah. going to be really interesting. Stay tuned for I that. I agree. I agree. Well, Patty, uh, super interesting. I think these are trends we got to be paying attention to. So good stuff. Really do. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of Greensheet.com and CCSalesPro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.